All right, I'd like to welcome everyone to another episode of the Focus Hunting Podcast. Today I'm joined by my good buddy Nick Bowker of Nick Bowker Hunting in South Africa. Nick and I talk about what you can expect when hunting with him out in South Africa. We touch on Seas of the Lion and how anti-hunters in South Africa compare to the ones here in Canada. Also want to give a quick shout out to BC's Interior Chapter of SCI. If you guys aren't members yet, make sure you go to www.bcinteriorsci.ca. Click on that membership tab, become members today. I also want to give a quick shout out to Eric N. Eric wrote me in and said how much he loved the show and he asked if we're going to be covering any training information on the Focus Hunting Podcast. You bet, Eric, we got some information on that coming out here real soon, so stay tuned. And uh, be sure to check your email because I'm going to be sending you a $50 gift certificate. But uh, I think for now we're going to get right into this show, so enjoy, guys. This sucks. Welcome to the Focus Hunting Podcast, Nick. Thanks, Kevin. I appreciate you having me. Um, Nick, uh, maybe before uh, we get into our conversation here today, you can just give the listeners here in Canada and and those in the U.S. who are listening uh, the rundown on who you are. Uh, well, I'm Nick Barker from Nick Barker Hunting, South Africa. Um, I've lived my entire life in the Bedford area of the Eastern Cape of South Africa. I shot my first animal at the age of six. I've been hunting ever since, and I've been a professional hunter and outfitter for 25 years. Family originally came over from Britain in the 1820s, um, and then we settled on the farm Walla Fountain, where, where I am now in the 1880s, and this is the base for Nick Barker Hunting. You mentioned you lived in the Bedford area of South Africa. Where uh, where exactly is that? So Bedford is in the Eastern Cape, which is sort of eastern southern part of the country. Closest big city is Port Elizabeth, uh, and the lodge is about uh, two hours north of that. So anybody coming to hunt with me would you generally fly into Johannesburg, which is our major hub, and then you catch a connecting flight to Port Elizabeth. Here in Canada, we're classified, I guess, as like a, a first world country. Um, can you maybe tell me what it was like growing up in uh, in South Africa? I grew up in the, in the 70s in South Africa. As I say, the, the freedom that we were afforded back in those days was just unbelievable. Um, you know, I started hunting when I was six. I shot my first uh, springbuck when I was around six with a point two two. Um, by the age of eight, I was up with our with our hound pack every morning at half past four, um, chasing jackal and caracal, which obviously are a menace to the sheep and the game. Um, obviously, I had to work on the ranch and stuff like that. In those days, the the freedom we were afforded uh, and the responsibility we were given at a young age, something that I don't think kids anywhere in the world get that anymore, and, and it's perhaps a shame, I don't know. But um, yeah, I mean, I really enjoyed it. So... How did you get into the outfitting business? Was this uh, a family business or is it something you just kind of, you kind of started yourself? It's actually something I started myself. Um, as I said, uh, we, my family's been there for five generations and we basically gen- focused on uh, sheep farming. Um, and so when I completed my mil- military service and been to university, I came back to the ranch and I decided to put my hunting skills to work. So I qualified as a professional hunter and then I hunted for, for another company for two years. And then once I built up some experience, um, a friend of mine and I started an outfitting business together. Uh, we did that for about 10 years and then we, we split up after that. And then from there, I moved on to Nick Barker Hunting um, and that's been going 15 years. It looks like a pretty, pretty neat spot. Can you tell me a bit about your lodge? What can, uh, what can people expect when they come stay with you? The lodge is slightly different from the, from the typical sort of African lodge that you, that comes to mind. Um, so the lodge is the original farmhouse that was built in the 1880s with the stone walls, and high ceilings, uh, a lot of history in there, a lot of antiques. Um, and then the client rooms, I've recently redone those. Uh, so they, uh, Honestly, first class, uh, ensuite bathrooms, very luxurious. And then we've got an entertainment area with a bar and a big stone fireplace mm-hmm. that, we, that we light a fire every night. Sometimes we cook on the fire. Then uh, we've got a stunning view looking down over the valley and there's a swimming pool. So, you know, you can really make yourself at home and feel comfortable. So what type of hunts do you offer out there? 
First of all, I'm a, I'm a small personalized operation. I only have one, generally only have one group of hunters in camp at a time, or maybe two sets of two. Um, I've, I have got a professional hunter, Benjamin Pringle, that assists me. I do the hunting. So from that perspective, it is fairly unique. And then I specialize in free range plans game hunting. Uh, so by free range, I mean no high fences. Um, animals are free to come and go as they please. We've got about a base of about 80,000 acres that I hunt on. That includes our ranch and all the neighbors. And then also, have, uh, depending on what species you're looking for, also have access to other ranches around Bedford. Um, so it's a big hunting area. And yeah, you won't, you're not going to run into any other hunters while you're with me. And, yeah. So what type of species are we talking about in these in these hunts? For the first timer, I do an eight day seven trophy hunt and that varies, but generally species like Kudu, Nyala, Gemsbuck, Lesbuck, Springbuck, Warthog, Impala, the sort of package deal. Um, and that kind of ties in nicely because you've got the animals like Kudu and Nyala are very much in the thick terrain, requires a lot of time, a lot of glassing, a lot of patience, uh, early morning, late evening hunting. And then the sort of springback, blessback, plains game animals you can hunt during the day. They're out in the open. A typical hunt's going to test various skills from a hunter. You're going to need some long shots. You're going to need some quick shots. Uh, um, so I think it offers a real neat introduction to hunting in Africa. Also offer cull hunts, which is quite unique. From the cull hunts, you're shooting in those different species. You're shooting males that are don't think will turn into trophies um so it, it's a, it helps in the management so it's getting rid of some of the some of the bad blood in the species uh, and they've become quite popular because uh, on a typical hunt you can either do 20 animal or a 30 animal so that involves quite a lot of shooting and a lot of fun you mentioned long shots i assume all the the hunting methods are rifle or is there any archery style hunts as well Purely rifle hunting uh, due to the terrain and as you as you rightly said um there is some longer range, longer range shooting involved. So what's the process like to get a rifle into the country? Is there a lot of paperwork involved in getting a rifle into South Africa? Um, to get a rifle into South Africa, um, what I recommend is there's a company called riflepermit.com and various others. So they will handle the paperwork. You just email, get hold of them, and they will send you a package with all the paperwork that you've got to fill in. So they'll, they'll do all that for you, and they'll meet you at the airport. So that makes life a lot easier. Um, You're allowed two rifles, must be of different calibers, and I think it's 200 rounds in total. Once you've got all your paperwork, you'll be checked in the US or the Canadian side, everything, and then when you arrive in uh, South Africa again, you go to customs, and there you'll check your, I mean, sorry, not customs, the South African Police Service, and there you'll just hand in your paperwork, and everything is in order, and then off you go with with your rifle. Oh, yeah. Well, that doesn't sound too hard, I guess. Um, you mentioned you're allowed two calibers. What caliber would you recommend for this type of hunting? I recommend for what we're doing and, and, and the size of the animals that you're shooting, uh, seven rem mag, 300 wood mag in and around those calibers, a little bit fatter shooting and packing a little bit of punch, but something that you, something that you are comfortable with. For those people that don't want, to, don't want the hassle of bringing their rifles in, I do have rifles that I allow people to use free of charge, and I've got a 7 rem mag and a 300 wind mag. Oh, yeah. I guess that uh, makes things a little easier if, if they can just use uh, one of your rifles, eh? Yeah. Uh, it's becoming more and more popular. Um, but, I mean, for the guys, the old guys that, you know, have their special rifle that they want to bring, um, it's not as difficult and as daunting as you, as you think. As I said, I would definitely get hold of people that specialize in the paperwork and they get everything done for you and you get, you get, they meet you at the airport and take you through everything. And it's fairly straightforward. And I mean, a lot of rifles have come into South Africa in the, over the last 10 years for sure. In Canada here, we're going through a big shift in what uh, the government classifies as legal firearms. Now I'm assuming, you know, laws, firearm laws are different from country to country and what here in Canada we consider illegal. You guys might consider legal. So are there any, restrictions on types of firearms that can be brought into your country i mean can't bring in a fully automatic no no fully automatic no semi-autos and no handguns no no sort of self-defense handguns you can bring a handgun in for hunting uh but it needs to be classified as, as a hunting revolver basically that does require a bit of extra paperwork so the, the rifles you bring in they want to be classified as hunting rifle and then shotguns obviously will burn hunting. 
So what about leaving the country? I know here in Canada, sometimes it's harder to get back into your own country than it is to leave. Have you had any incidences where clients uh, have had a little difficulty getting back home or getting out of South Africa? No, only, the only instance I've had of clients not being able to get home was when 9-11 happened and they were caught in Joburg for a week before they could fly in. And apart from that, never had any issues. Um, once or twice, the guy's rifles have arrived late, but we've managed to get them delivered to the ranch in 24 hours, so it hasn't been a big major issue. So, um, and and this, down in the Eastern Cape, it's very safe. I mean, the lodge, is, I don't even, when, when I'm not there, I don't even lock it. Um, so we've never had any security issues or anything like that. Yeah, I guess uh, 9-11 was a little bit of issue in terms of flying for, for pretty much anyone, but uh, those American clients you had at the time, they must have... Must have been pretty scary for them not knowing what was going on back at home. Yeah, no, that was just yeah, bad timing and and yeah, um, yeah, certainly after 9-11, uh, the hunting industry took a big knock in, in certainly in South Africa. Oh, is that right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, obviously, keeping the hide is a huge part of these hunts. So after the hunt, is is the taxidermy done in South Africa and then shipped back stateside? Okay, so you've got with your with your trophies, you've got two options. Um, so we'll field prep them, skin them, uh, and salt them. And then I'll take them to my local taxidermist. And then when they get to him, you've got two options. If you want the taxidermy work done back in Canada or the United States, um, they will then do a dip and pack, which is basically just a chemical treatment and then ship the trophies out. They'll be done your side, or you can get the trophies mounted in South Africa. And then shipped over. Right. And then your pH pulls in a, a register, and this acts as your um, export permit. Okay. So, with the United States is changing government from red back to blue again, um, I remember President Obama's administration implementing a ban that restricted all imports of trophies from certain regions of South Africa. I think there were six. I can't remember which ones in particular. But um, now they have Joe Biden, who's president. And he's, uh, you know, he doesn't hide the fact that he's no fan of, of guns or hunting. Um, now there's been talks about Joe Biden banning all imports of trophies into the United States. Now, I know here in Canada, that would have a crushing blow to the to the outfitter industry. Um, I'm assuming it would be devastating to the guides in South Africa too, but just how devastating would that be? I mean, the banning of trophies, yeah, I mean, it, it's, I don't think people realize quite, quite the impact that the banning of trophies is going to have. I mean, for most hunters that come out and hunt, they're going to want to take the trophy back, and I, I understand that. Um, so, I mean, you know, they're starting with things like line and, and stuff like that, as you said, but I think that's just to get a foothold and then they're going to push on for everything else. And, I mean, just the immediate impact with me, um, if I had to shut my, my trophy hunting business down, um, I would need to cull a number of animals. I would need to get rid of most of them uh, so I can increase my sheep numbers just to make a living. Um, so, I mean, that's just the first impact is... <laughs> hundreds of animals gone. The others to be affected, I mean, it's the big impact on the hunting shops. I'm not going to be supporting them anymore. Um, you know, the local supermarkets rely on the hunting outfitters. We buy a lot of their produce and, and stuff like that to keep keep our lodge going. Um, your trackers, skinners, camp staff, caterers, they're all directly affected and lose their jobs and their families. Um, I mean, the whole taxidermy business, which is big in South Africa, would be shut down. Um, and all the meat that feeds the local population. Um, I mean, all my camp staff and trackers and skinners, whenever we're hunting, they get, they get as much meat as they can eat um, and the rest is supplied to the local butcher. So, I mean, it's just a whole, just a whole network of industries that are going to get shut down and million, billions of rands. So what percent of your clients are, are from the United States? 90, 95%. Yeah, so that would be uh, obviously be quite the blow to not just your business, but uh, but to the the entire outfitting business there. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it would bring it, it would basically bring it to its knees. Yeah, well, hopefully that doesn't happen. I know the anti-hunting organizations they like to use the word trophy as bravado against hunters. Um, 
you know, you mentioned uh, it starts with lions and elephants. Here we're sort of facing the same thing. We deal with anti-hunters targeting uh, predators like bears and, and mountain lions and, and those type of hunts. Uh, I always go back to, you know, it's the lowest lowest hanging fruit on the tree. It always gets picked. And then uh, after lions and elephants, what's it going to be next? Uh, it's the same issue that, that we deal with here. Um, I know our outfitting industry is constantly under attack from anti-hunting organizations. Uh, you know, there seems to have been a huge movement in the last, I don't know, uh, maybe four or five years. I think it started when uh, that Cecil the Lion incident happened. And, uh, you know, I don't know the whole story there. And uh, Was it legal? I'm sure it was legal. Was it ethical? It probably, you know, um, probably wasn't handled the best way. But, uh, I mean, it is what it is. And, you know, I always tell hunters in our area and, and hunters I talk to that, you know, it's important to band together as hunters and, um, you know, cause these anti-hunting groups, whether they're over there or they're here, they're, they have one mission and, you know, they're not going to stop at one thing. Absolutely. And, and I think kind of what you're saying is that uh, as hunters, we don't want to give them ammunition to fight against us. So, you know, things like the Cecil the Lion story was unfortunate. Um, I mean, I guess the only guy that knows the real story was the PH involved. Um, as you said, it, it was legal. Um, you know, I don't know how far he was baiting from the national park, but that's probably not ethical. When they shot the line and they discovered the, discovered the collar, that was the time to come clean and say we've made a, you know, we've made a mistake. And then maybe things wouldn't have got so out of hand. Um, and so that's why I think it's very important for for us as hunters and guides to, you know, do things by the book. Yeah. Was that as much of a big deal down in South Africa? You know, in the United States, I mean, it just blew up. I believe he was a dentist. You know, he had to shut down his, uh, he had to shut down his practice. And yeah, he just, I think he moved from where he was living and yeah, it was, he just couldn't recover from that. But was it as big of a deal down there as, as they made it out to be in, uh, in the U.S.? Um, perhaps not quite as big, but I mean, the anti hunters certainly made a big deal out of it, yeah, and 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 really cashed in on it. And and I feel really sorry for the for the client in that position because I mean, as you say, I mean, he had to close down his practice and he actually didn't do anything wrong, he was following orders from his from his guard. Um, and and I think that moving on to that point, that's the importance you need to do your, your you know, homework when you especially when you're going a long way to hunt you need to do your homework and make sure you're getting a reputable outfitter and uh and ph you mentioned the anti-hunting organizations down there um here in canada and the u.s uh the anti-hunting organizations there seems to be a lot of them and they're all very well organized they seem to be well funded and meticulous when it comes to their position on hunting what are they like down there in terms of public support and presence um, th there is. I don't think they're quite as organized as your anti-hunting. Uh, and, and we're certainly not under as much pressure as you guys are. Um, but I think they do feed off what happens in the States and in Canada. Yeah, it is becoming more and more of an issue. That's why podcasts like this are so important. Spread the hunting word around and uh, get young people involved in hunting too. Um, I've got two twin girls that are they're about to turn 13, but they've been hunting since they were six or seven. Um, so yeah, just to, I think that's very important is to get the younger generation involved too. Yeah. And I think that's just it. I know for myself, my brothers and I, we were taught the importance of, uh, animal harvest, not to waste anything. And, uh, you know, that's something I ingrained on my children as well. You know, I think that's part of the biggest misconception is, um, you know, the use of, of meat in these so-called trophy hunts, as they like to be portrayed, uh, nothing goes to waste. It's all utilized. It feeds, you know, tons of people, villages. Um, you know, it's funny when you think of anti-hunting or anti-hunting animal rights conservationists, you know, the term conservation by definition is the prevention of a wasteful use of a resource. Um, you know, that defines basically everything that, that hunters are. We don't waste anything. It's all utilized. Um, well, and that's, that's probably the irony of it is that, you know, the anti-hunting groups look at us as bloodthirsty and just wanting to kill animals. But our love of the outdoors and, and of maintaining animals and maintaining the habitat is, is far stronger than theirs ever will be. Yeah, it's funny how tangled the word conservation has become. Um, 
I don't see the anti-hunting community doing a lot for conservation. They like to push for non-pragmatic hunting closures, such as, you know, the grizzly bear. And You know, I remember once listening to a representative from uh, Born Free USA talk about Teddy Roosevelt killing, you know, over 5,000 animals in Africa and then, and then cloaking all that by declaring or um, dedicating thousands of acres to national forest. Um, you know, this is obviously nothing more than fallacy to um, persuade the non-hunting community to perhaps take their side. They reference hunters as a dystopian, rugged provider you know, that has since been replaced by a trophy hunter who is um, nothing more than a shooter in a canned environment. And, um, you know, they talk about um, these guided hunts as hunters or shooters having the ability to select animals off a menu. And, and you know, it doesn't really matter what type of hunt we're talking about. Uh, to them, it's they classify everything as a trophy hunt. And, you know, I think of the word trophy hunting as, um, you know, my house is decorated with lots of skulls and hides from animals I've killed over the years. And, you know, when I look at all the, the skulls and, and hides and, um, you know, to me, I see a story. Everyone is, everyone is unique. It's a, it's a remembrance of an experience shared with, you know, my father, my son, my brother, or, you know, myself and, and nature. Well, and and I mean, I, I agree with you 100%. And the, the problem is, I think they're using the word trophy, you know, they're, they're turning the word trophy around. I mean, from my understanding, it originally came around. I mean, a trophy animal, we're not going out to look for something to put on your wall. We're going out to look for an animal that's bred and he's past his prime and he's old and he's generally on his own. Um, that is, to me, what a trophy is. Uh, it's not necessarily the biggest animal. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the anti-hunters misuse the term trophy to their advantage, obviously. Um, and, I mean, the, the everything from that so-called trophy animal is used. I mean, the meat, the hide, everything is is utilised. So, and, I mean, you can explain that to them till you're blue in the face. You summed it up there. Every time you look at a set of antlers, you know, it takes you back to, to the experience you had, the time that you spent outdoors, you were cold, you were wet, or you were hot, and and the effort it took to get to that animal and enjoying the outdoors. Yeah. You know, but, I mean, you and I can talk all day about this, but uh, back to your hunts, how many hunts do you offer per year, you know, say pre-COVID? I do, I, I like to do about 15 hunts a year. So that probably translates to around 35 hunters. Yeah. Um, together you know some of the twos and threes and fours and some of ones so yeah i could do about 15 hunts and with 35 hunters a year i mean obviously covid's had some impact on 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 you guys out there but uh how affected have you been from from covid to put it into perspective i did two hunts last year one in march and i got another one in december and i was one of the lucky outfitters some people had none um, so, I mean, it's basically brought the whole industry to a complete standstill for a year. You know, how things are going to pan out this year, we don't know yet. We, we hopeful. Um, I've got, I think, nine hunts booked with about 24 hunters. But, I mean, that all depends whether they can get flights and all that sort of stuff. So, we, we're we still positive. Um, but, yeah, I, I don't think a lot of people in the industry, I don't think they can survive another year of no hunting. A lot of staff and, and, and people involved in a, in a hunting business and they've all got to be paid. Um, so hopefully we can get it up and running as soon as possible. I know here in Canada, a lot of locals stepped up and they helped out the guide industry. Um, I mean, that was part of the response from the guide outfitters was they were giving substantial deals to Canadian out, to Canadian residents for, for hunts just because, you know, the, the borders to the U.S. were closed and they get... And you know, same situation with you. I think here it's like 98% of the clients for the guides are from the U S. So yeah, when they shut the international borders down, it, it, uh, it rocked the, the guiding industry hard. So do you guys offer hunts to, to locals? Like, is that something you guys do down there as well? Or is that just not an option um, or just something yeah, maybe that locals aren't interested in? No, there's a, there's a big, there's a big, uh, big local, uh, hunting industry. Um, so 90% of that, is for for meat hunting for for their own use um 
but yes, the same same kind of thing happened. Yeah, Outfitters uh, ran a lot of specials and and got a lot of local hunters into to hunt, um, which I mean did help. But I mean, you know, still uh, a massive shortfall. You know, and you know, I'm obviously I'm not familiar with how things work uh, uh, in terms of of guide outfitter operations out there. Here we have uh, a guide fitter out a guide outfitter association that uh, represents and, and lobbies for outfitters. Um, they're currently working on a recovery plan for the outfitters in BC. Do you guys have something similar to that? Is there an organization or group that uh, that represents all you outfitters as a whole? and um, Or maybe is there a recovery strategy plan for post-COVID? We have uh, the Professional Hunters Association of South Africa. We have another thing called uh, Wildlife Ranches of South Africa. Um, so, I mean, they're trying to help, but there's no, um, as far as I can understand, there's no structure in place to try and turn things around. I think everybody's just kind of on their own trying to get things going again. Um, I mean, I think as soon as we can get on top of this COVID, I think hunting will go strong again in South Africa. You know, I'm I'm optimistic and uh, hopeful that everything, you know, in a year from now, everybody will bounce back and the floodgates open for for all you guys and, uh, you know, Everything goes back to normal for all of us. You no, know, absolutely. As I said, I think, uh, and and the hunting community, as you say, I mean, worldwide, we always band together. And you know, I know the guys, I've got guys that want to come this year. And, and if they can get flights here, they said they're going to come. So, you know, that's just that's at least a positive step in the right direction. Uh, I know my dad and I have talked about doing a hunt like that. Uh, so, I mean, that's going to be on our radar here in the next next few years. Hopefully, hopefully he maintains his health and uh, and we can uh, get out there to see you for a hunt. That'd be nice. No, yeah, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, always awesome to go hunting with your dad or your kids. That kind of, you know, just makes it. Yeah. What's the, is there an age limit for youth with you guys? Uh, no, as long as as long as he's under as long, under the supervision of a professional hunter, then there's no no age limit. On your website, you got a you've got a checklist for first time African hunts, which uh, you know I think is a great idea. It's kind of a all you need to know reference guide. You have some information there on hunting laws in South Africa. Um, is there any specific hunting laws that you think maybe people should be aware of when when planning a trip like this? Um, well, I mean, it's fairly straightforward. Any any foreign any foreign hunter can come to South Africa, but in order to hunt, he needs to be uh, he needs to be with a licensed professional hunter. And I go back to exporting your trophies. You you're going to need a licensed uh, professional hunter to get your trophies out because you need to fill in that register for you. So, I mean, that goes back to doing your homework, making sure that that the guy you deal with is licensed and legitimate. Um, apart from that, there are no laws that are that are going to affect uh, overseas hunters coming in. There are different laws for local hunters, different times of the year and stuff like that. But uh, overseas hunters can come at any time, um, as I said, as long as they're in the, in the care of a, of a licensed professional hunter. Never had any bad bad incidences. Um, I think the worst thing worst thing that's happened to me was I was it was a good 10, 15 years ago. I was hunting with a fairly elderly gentleman. We were, we were looking for kudu, but he brought a handgun with, and he wanted to try and shoot something with a handgun. So I said, that's fine. We'll just carry it. And if we get the opportunity to get in close to something, you can use it. And um, we were hunting in another area, and um, I saw a nice water boar grazing next to sort of an old, broken-down, dilapidated barn. Um, so I said to him, come on, Oni, um, this is a good chance for us to use your handgun. We should be able to get in close. Yeah, we can use the, use the old barn as, as cover. And anyway, so we snuck our way around and I stuck my head around and, and the water had actually grazed right forward. So it was literally six, seven yards from me. Whispered to him, it's right in front. Yeah, I can't come around with you because you're going to see me. So you must just step around and make the shot. Anyway, Bonnie Judy stepped around and he made the shot and it sounded hit. And I saw the water breaking that way. So I sort of raked one in from behind it to try and slow it down. And uh, we set off following it. And after we'd gone about uh, 20, 30 yards, my tracker, Alvin, is walking by to me and he said, sir, we've got a problem. So I said, what now? Um, anyway, he pointed to the left and Arnie had inadvertently shot a sheep. Oh, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> he hadn't seen the water, which was five or six yards from him, and he'd seen the sheep sort of 30 yards away. And, he'd, and in his excitement, he'd shot the sheep. So we had a dead sheep 
and we wounded warthog. Anyway, we subsequently retrieved the warthog and we had to go back because we were hunting on somebody else's property. We had to go back to the landowner and I had to explain to, explain to him why I'd shot a sheep. Um, anyway, he, he saw the humor in it and we settled up everything and it was all, all's well that ends well. Oh, well, that's good. So you, um, you mentioned clients can come uh, anytime year round. So you offer your hunts on a year round basis? Uh, pretty much. I would say the best months are March through October. Um, after October, sort of January, February, everything's got, uh, you know, they've kitted and they've got small, you know, they've got young, young stuff. Uh, so you don't really want to chase animals around then. So the majority of the season is March through April, uh, March through October, beg your pardon. Like this year, last year, when things were so abnormal, I had a hunter in December and went all fine. What about gear for a trip like this? What kind of gear do we need for a hunt? Um, well, the biggest mistake everybody makes is bringing too many too many clothes. You just need two sets of hunting of hunting gear because your laundry gets done every day, um, and then some some nice comfortable stuff to wear in the evenings around the fire. Um, maybe a jacket or two, good walking shoes. Um, the most important thing is a good set of binoculars because we will do an awful lot of glassing, and it'll just if you've got a good set of binos, you know, you're going to be participating in the glassing and seeing what's going on and, and helping and maybe even finding your own animals. So that, that to me is the most important thing. Um, obviously, if you bring your own rifles, you need to be comfortable with them and, and have, have shot them a lot. If you're going to use my rifles, we'll spend, you know, a good, goodly part on the first morning on the range so you're getting comfortable with them. And, I mean, you know, that's basically it. You don't have to, really don't have to bring a lot of stuff. So do you have a range out at your place there? I do have a, a range where we, yeah, I mean, certainly we will, if you bring your rifle, we'll sight it in when we're there to make sure it's on. And if you're using my rifle, then you'll, you'll shoot it a good couple of times to get comfortable with it. I mean, traveling anywhere, you know, a lot can happen to your rifle and it's always good to check. But yeah, yeah imagine uh, flying in a plane. At, uh, there's a pretty good chance that uh, your sights might be off a little bit. So you have to re-zero it. And, and what I also do on the range is most of our, most of our shots are taken off shooting sticks. Um, so I'll have you take a good few couple of shots off shooting sticks to make sure you're comfortable. And there's a gong, I've got a gong out at 100 yards and you have to hit the gong off the shooting sticks before we, before we can set forth. I'm assuming you guys use the shooting sticks for, for pretty much the majority of your hunts? Uh, yeah, so I'm, I, I'll always carry the shooting sticks with me and, and, and then set them up for you. So, yeah, I mean, I would guess 80, 90% of your shots are going to be taken off shooting sticks just because of the terrain and, and where you're walking in that. I mean, sometimes you get lucky and then we can go prone over a backpack or bar pods or whatever. So that, that does help. And especially if you're taking a longer shot, then, then we're going to get a good, strong base. But uh, majority of the time, yeah, off shooting sticks. What kind of distances would be considered a long, a long shot? Um, well, I mean, personally, I consider anything from anything from three hundred yards up is, is a long shot, so three four hundred yards. You know, if people are comfortable and they and they can do longer shots, that that's a, that's up to them. Uh, it is a the terrain does afford you that, but I mean, that's something you need to be comfortable with and have practiced a lot. Imagine the topography, it's pretty flat out there, I'm assuming. What kind of, what's the longest shot that you've seen out there? I've seen a shot of over a thousand yards. Wow. That's a long shot. Yeah. And um, that's, you know, that's with the right equipment, um, tactical scope, uh, good yeah. range finders, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And experience. I, can, I mean, I experience exactly. And I mean, but I mean, that's, that's really not the norm. I mean, the normal, um, most of our, on a typical eight down, most of our shots are going to be between, between 150 and 350. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's manageable for sure. I think my longest shot ever was 402 and that was last year. And I thought that was a long way. Well, that, I mean, that is any, any, any time you're going past 250, it, it, it's getting out there. To be fair, you know, a quick shot or shooting sticks at 150 is just, as difficult or more difficult than you lying prone, testing the wind and all that sort of stuff at say five, 600. So, you know, all different variables in play. What's the most dangerous animal you offer in, in your hunt packages? I know, you know, when you watch um, the African hunts on TV, they always talk about the, the dangerous, you know, like Cape Buffalo or what's the most dangerous um, in your packaged hunt? Um, certainly we offer Buffalo hunts. That is certainly the most, the most dangerous. Um, they can be mean. Um, yeah, I mean, a buffalo hunt, it's just a, a real adrenaline rush. 
because what we call dugger boys, the old bulls that live on their own, um, you, they're always shot in thick stuff. So, you know, I mean, it's 50 yards and closer. Uh, sometimes it can be 20 yards, 15 yards. So if something goes wrong there, you know, you can get yourself into big trouble. You don't have much time to, to, uh, to recover. No, 20 yards offer a lot of reaction time, especially with something that big. Have you guys ever had any uh, any instances where somebody got hurt? Uh, I've never had anybody got, that's got hurt. Uh, the closest we've come, we stopped a bull at seven yards. Yeah. When you, when you say stopped, what he was uh, he was charging in, and you guys put him down. Exactly. Yeah, we 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 shot him at about uh, probably about forty seven yards in thick stuff, and uh, sort of hit him, and he went down, and he got up, and got into some really thick stuff that we couldn't see what was going on. Uh, and then when he came out, he probably came out. At, the next time we saw him, he was probably 15 yards away. But, uh, the client must have been, uh, I wonder what he thought well, about was, that. <laughs> As I said, all's well that ends well. It certainly provided some uh, high adrenaline stuff. There's nothing that gets your adrenaline going like, uh, like an ar- animal barreling down on you. Um, we have grizzly bears here, so I've had a few run-ins with some mean and nasty bears that uh, that were a little yeah, too close a, for my liking. That's a, that's a big animal there too, with a lot of a lot of capability to do damage. So, what kind of money would one of these package hunt deals uh, run somebody? Um, I've got a package hunt that you can do for four thousand US. Uh, that includes eight days accommodation, seven trophy animals. All your board and lodging, everything included. So from the moment I pick you up at Port Elizabeth Airport, anything that excludes your taxi demi work and your flights. Well, that seems pretty affordable. I think uh, I looked into it before, and I think from Vancouver to Johannesburg, it would have cost me roughly a thousand dollars Canadian. So I mean, that's definitely doable. I mean, that's that's a that's a good deal. You know, especially right now too, the airlines are hurting. So I think you're going to find a lot of good deals. Uh, you know, airlines trying to entice people to get back up in the air flying again. So, I mean, you know, something like this is, is definitely going to be affordable and probably now the time to do it. I, I think so. And, and and I think a lot of a lot of people in the U.S. and Canada don't re- actually realize how affordable a hunt in Africa is. Um, you know, and, and this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. So, uh, yeah. That's, no, ab- absolutely. And, and, and I just think, the uniqueness of the Eastern Cape and specifically around the Bedford area is just the different number of species and, and, and different terrain that we've got now quickly it changes. Um, it, it, it'll honestly blow your mind. Yeah, for sure. Well, I think, uh, like I said, uh, my dad and I, we've been talking about it, uh, a lot lately. And, uh, I think you can, can expect us down there as soon as, uh, we know for certain what's going on with these, uh, with, uh, the, f- the COVID restrictions and everything, I think you're going to, you can expect us down there for sure. Oh, I'd lo- love to have you out hunting. Love to. Yeah. You know, my day is just starting, but yours is coming to an end here. Um, is there anything else you'd like people, uh, you know, in Canada here to, uh, to know? I mean, all, all I'd like to say is that uh, just take the leap of faith. It's a lot simpler and a lot easier and a lot cheaper than everybody thinks. And it's honestly, it's safe. And I mean, as you said, it's a once in a lifetime memory that you're going to have um it really is worth doing if um, anybody wants to get hold of me uh, the easiest way is to go to my website nick Bowker hunting um mm-hmm. and i've also got a closed facebook account where you know anti-hunters can't see what's going on and abuse you putting up deals and showing you what's been shot and stuff like that so if you want to join that uh, go to my website and email we put you in there and then you can see what's going on and and you can speak to other guys that have hunted with me Okay, buddy. I'm going to let you go here, but it's always a pleasure talking to you, and uh, we'll talk again soon. And uh, Absolute pleasure, Kevin. Thank you very much for, for having me, and yeah, hopefully we'll see you in the not-too-distant future, and yeah, happy hunting, and hopefully we can be back to full full steam next year. You believe that? Wow. I guess it's all worth it.